Mr. Papadfus, uh, you, you are an attorney or you're not an attorney? I'm not an attorney. Okay. You sounded like you had some pride in that response. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a small business owner and uh, I'm here willingly on my own to speak the truth. Okay. Uh, would you like to uh, raise your right hand and be sworn, please? Do you swear that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Today's an important day to me because five years ago, this month, I stood up and I urged uh, then Attorney General Tom Corbett to investigate a pattern of law breaking, of criminal behavior at the Harrisburg Authority. My calls for that investigation were reported in the Patriot News, on the television, um, and to this day, I don't think they've gone anywhere. We just ended with DCED saying uh, we would have needed a criminal complaint with the Attorney General um, to actually effectuate some sort of a, um, a fraud charge. Well, there were people at the time saying that this was fraudulent, this was criminal, and the Attorney General needed to investigate because the Attorney General is the one who is empowered under the Municipal Authorities Act to regulate municipal authorities. I'd like to look specifically at 2007 uh, because that is the period of time that I was on the authority. I was one of the appointees. Uh, I replaced Fred Clark on the authority by city council. I didn't take my seat until August of uh, 2007. I called for the Attorney General's investigation in September. I worked with the FBI and their public corruption unit from September and into October. And I resigned from the authority in November of 2007 after voting against the working capital loan and after voting against the Covanta loan. And saying at the time, in public meetings, both at the authority and in city council chambers, and to the authorities that the numbers didn't add up, that there was no way uh, that the debt should continue to be characterized as self-liquidating. And the issue of the 2007 debt, the fact that in 2007, at the same time, a certificate is being filed which basically says that the 2003 borrowings and the uh, 1998 borrowings are still self-liquidated. You heard this morning from the attorney who was speaking, there was no reason to believe that at all. I'll turn you to the, you know, to page 106 of the, uh, of the audit, which she referred to this morning, which basically says, there were 17 sets of financial projections that were run through by the financial advisors in 2007. None of them, none of them showed that the debt could have been characterized, still the 2003 and 98 debt still characterized as self-liquidating. So what I'm here to say is that there was a deliberate, deliberate attempt perpetuated by a number of different folks in 2007 to circumvent the Debt Act and to essentially break the law, to borrow money which we shouldn't have been allowed to borrow. And that has, by law, that has huge repercussions for the current state of the financial crisis in Harrisburg. It has um, important repercussions for what you all do because I firmly believe it's not a question of whether or not you had laws on the books. It's a question of whether or not there was any enforcement of those laws. And the problem really lies, as the attorney said this morning, that the professionals are the police. The professionals were the police. The professionals were policing themselves. And at no point would anyone step in and basically say, there are consequences for breaking the law. And still to this day, that hasn't happened. And I have to say as well, I'm deeply troubled by the testimony that you just heard from Ms. Berrettini, who I don't know personally. But I can tell you, I do have specific recollection in October of 2007 that then Authority Chairman James Ellison and then Bond Counsel Carol Pacheris were both very concerned that DCED would not 
uh, accept the clean certification letter that was filed, and that, in fact, they would demand a downgrade. So those conversations occurred, presumably, they occurred between Ms. Gutierrez and Ms. Berrettini. She has no specific recollection of it, but I think it strains credulity to, stay, to say here today that she had no real reason to believe that there was anything wrong that she didn't find out until later, uh, based on you know, what she read in the papers, that there were problems with Barlow and the retrofit. Those articles were published prior to the fall of 2007. And I think if you drill down on the certification that was filed in 2007, you'll see from the forensic audit that no one in their right mind should have thought that the debt was self-liquidating. No one, no financial advisor, put forth any set of projections that showed that it was self-liquidating. And DCED certainly knew at that time the history of the Harrisburg incinerator and certainly should have stood up and raised some red flags. And it was well within their uh, jurisdiction. Now, Ms. Berrettini is currently an attorney with Betty Evans. Betty Evans, she left the state to work for them. Many, no one benefited more from the 2007 borrowings than Betty Evans. Betty Evans got paid as the attorneys for the county hundreds of thousands of dollars from these questionable working uh, capital loans. Nobody benefits more to this day from Ms. Berrettini's decision to accept the clean certification in 2007 than Betty Evans, arguably, because if we weren't allowed to borrow the money, and if Medi Evans was knowledgeably pushing to file something that was fraudulent, then the question becomes whether or not paying the money back should fall on the backs of the taxpayers of Harrisburg that had nothing to do with it, or there should be accountability from the professionals that swore an oath to their profession, as well as filed documents saying that this was, in fact, the right thing to do. If they're culpable and they're held accountable, then theoretically, Betty Evans could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars and could be contributing to the accountability fund, which is in the receiver's plan. It was part of Uncle Vic's plan that has been adopted by General Lynch. There are provisions to recover money from the professionals that were involved. So, the fact that she has been recently hired by Betty Evans, I think calls into question, at least it does to me, her lack of specific recollection or her not recalling conversations, which I certainly recall secondhand, admittedly, because I've never met Ms. Berrettini. And I think you should call her back under oath to ask if she did speak to Earl Gutierrez at the time and why there aren't um, Whether well, there aren't records, you know, that are kept uh, five years uh, into the future, I think uh -huh. we determine. I'd be happy to answer the questions. First of all, let me tell you. Sure. Go ahead. Please. First of all, I retired with, with the state in April. My decision, I just up and retired. I turned 60 last year, <coughs> 25 years, and decided to retire. I didn't even tell my husband I was going to do it. I just went ahead and, and gave my notice. I went home. I had not had any discussions or even contemplated working. I had no discussions with anyone. No one, I had no one make any co connections or contacts or calls or emails or any kind of correspondence or contact whatsoever with anybody about a job for me. I hadn't even thought that far. It wasn't until after I left and I heard from a lot of bond counsel through the state that I had worked with over the years, including Mr. Unkovic, saying, oh, you know, so sorry, you know, it was a pleasure working with you, uh, you know, good luck, you know what you're gonna be doing, that kind of thing, after I left. And in the course of one of those communications, was asked, would you like to come in, you know, would you be interested in working, and if so, would you like to talk to us? And it was, and I said, yeah, at some point, not right now, but you know, that would be something I would be interested in talking to you about. Again, I didn't have a job offer, didn't even know if I was going to be working, had nothing to do with the Harrisburg deal or any other deal. Do you have any idea how many deal, you know, reviews I've done over the years in the course of 26 years? I mean, this kind of allegation is absurd. 
I happen to know a lot of bond counsel through my work, but I never, during the course of my employment with the, with the Commonwealth, ever had dinner with them or their spouses or significant others, didn't socialize with them outside the office. I, I wouldn't even go to lunch with them. I maintained, I would see them possibly on occasion in a few bar association functions, maybe, and I didn't even go to a lot of those. But I had no prior arrangement, no connection, no contact, no, uh, no, one, you know, headhunter doing a search, no, nothing whatsoever before I left employment with Commonwealth. So to try and tie that in with any decision, uh, any review I did in 26 years is just patently untrue and, and absurd. I'm sorry, but it is. Now, if you have any other questions, uh, I do not recall specifically, and I told Mr. Goldfield this when I met with him last year, I don't have any specific recollection other than I know I reviewed debt proceedings for the city and I know I reviewed some, but not all for the county, but I don't recall the specifics of them. I reviewed a lot of proceedings. I don't know what to say. And yes, maybe there were articles here and there. I didn't know that I read every single one of them or exactly when I became aware there were problems, but if you're going to rely on everything that's in the newspaper as true, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what the, the people who are now at DCP do with reviews, I don't know what, um, what you're going to hold them to. Mr. But Chairman, this kind of allegation is just absurd. I, first of all, I, I appreciate the courage of your, your testimony. I've said at the beginning of this, and the Chairman agrees with me on this, we're not prosecutors here, we're not a grand jury. Uh, this is a highly emotional circumstance for the people that are very close to it. I understand, I, I appreciate you defending yourself. I would tell, uh, tell everyone, uh, we're not here prosecuting. Uh, that's not our role. So uh, let's be careful with our public commentary and keep it on the facts of the case and allow the legislators sitting on this committee. And I will also put on the record, I never benefit other, I, the only income I earned was from my Commonwealth uh, salary. I didn't know anything. I was not involved in any side deals, never made any money off those deals, nothing of that nature. And I really resent this kind of smear. I, I really resent it. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your statement. Good, Mr. Pappas. My specific recollection is that James Ellison and Carol Kacharis were concerned that DCED would require a downgrade of the self-liquidating certification that was filed and uh, were conscious of that at the time and that there were conversations with DCED at the time. Um, the issue in 2007 is, and this is supported by the forensic audit, that no professional, no public figure, no one, thought the debt was still self-liquidating. And yet, at the same time, certifications were filed that it was, and money was borrowed. So the question really becomes, why did that happen? How did it happen? And what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen again? I can tell you that with regard to the Harrisburg Authority, you had a long pattern of corruption and law-breaking. You had an authority which for years was run by the mayor of the city of Harrisburg in a political fashion with individuals that sort of did what they were told and were not independent individuals. That emanated from the Special Projects Fund, which is not in the forensic audit, the scope of the forensic audit, but I'd be happy to talk to you about that at some point. And it sort of pervaded every aspect of how the authority did business. And it lent itself to a culture in which professionals did not feel that they should step up and sort of give a professional opinion. In fact, they should basically do what they were told. And it also led to a culture in which I think public officials felt that they were above the law and could act with impunity in everything that they were doing. What's interesting about 2007 is that you have essentially a new cast of characters. You don't have any more working for the Harrisburg Authority. Dan Lisby, Andrew Giorgione, even Steve Reed is marginalized at this point. What you have is a takeover of the Harrisburg Authority by James Ellison of Rose and Simon, uh, who is essentially running a sort of new political campaign out of the Harrisburg Authority. 
And that campaign is designed to get Linda Thompson elected mayor. And if you look at that graph that you've put out, which has the two lines showing when everything comes due, those lines are after the mayoral election. And it was no mistake, no simple accident, that none of the bills came due until after the mayoral election. The goal that James Ellison has expressed to me at the time was to elect Mayor Linda Thompson the next mayor, and that meant not upsetting the apple cart of the incinerator's financings at that time, and to push through um, a plan which he admitted to me uh, was, was something which we could not pay for. And it's not just my opinion, it is the forensic audit's conclusion that nobody thought that this could be paid for. I spoke out, I voted against it, I called on the Attorney General to investigate, and I was contacted in 2007 by the FBI Public Corruption Office here in Harrisburg. They told me they had an active ongoing investigation into the incinerator's finances and that I needed to work with them. I proceeded to give them documentation, including at least all of the copies that I had, 17 sets of financial numbers that showed that this wasn't working. And I, in 2007, had every expectation that they were the sort of um, investigated body that was going to handle the enforcement of what I saw as a crime being committed in front of, in front of my eyes. And they did nothing uh, for a fair period of time. They encouraged me uh, to stay out of the press and less vocal, which I did. I did resign. I did write, I did speak publicly, and I did write a resignation letter explaining that the debt was not self-liquidating, which the Patriot News did not publish uh, at the time. And then I was told that if I said anything else publicly at the time, I would be prosecuted for obstruction of justice by the then U.S. Attorney. I was told that by Agent Eric uh, Patterson, and the other agent who was part of the Public Corruption Unit here in Harrisburg was an agent by the name of Tim Lynch. Um, as a private citizen, as not a lawyer, I felt that at the time I did everything I could possibly do to alert people to the fact that what was being done here was a continuation of uh, a deliberate uh, attempt to circumvent the law. And basically since that time I've dedicated my life to uh, creating a public space where people can come and hopefully question their, uh, their uh, uh, folks in their community who are their politically elected leaders. I have uh, spent my own uh, fortune, such as it is, on trying to run for office and trying to reform what I see as a culture of corruption in which basically the professionals are policing themselves. And, um, and that's, why I'm, that's why I'm here today to speak out. Right. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the panel here? Senator Blake. This one, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you for your candor. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your commitment to your community. I would only want to ask you one question. In, in the course of the previous testimony, there was an avenue for a taxpayer complaint against the borrowing, and they indicated none were filed. Is, you never had a chance to, to uh, since you get into that, that channel, if you will, of objection. I was unaware that that was the channel of objection open to me at the time. Okay. I thought, uh, and when you're told by FBI officers that they have this investigation under control, um, not to continue pressing for the Attorney General to, to investigate that in fact they've got an active ongoing investigation and not to speak out publicly, well that's what you do. Now I had to resign because I felt I was in a completely untenable situation. It seemed to me that the uh, FBI was willing to continue to sort of watch the crime unfold, continue to watch uh, and, and, and make an effort to catch people in action. And my personal inclination was to speak out and say, no, stop, stop, stop. I resigned, I stayed quiet, and I did not say anything about the investigation publicly then from 2007 until 2009 when I felt that the investigation was going nowhere. And to this day, I do feel that uh, the U.S. Attorney and the federal investigators have been a part of the problem and have let down the people of Harrisburg. And I don't think that they're particularly well equipped to deal with um, matters of very complicated financial procedures. 
They were always much more interested in the fact that Steve Reed was taking tens of thousands of dollars of money out personally from the Special Projects Fund for questionable receipts and artifact purchases. Uh, or they were more interested in um, finding out what the uh, dealers who had sold them the artifacts thought and whether or not there was uh, people profiting on the side. And they were about a, you know, uh, a, a clean certificate uh, regarding self-liquidating debt. These were guys in their 20s and 30s, and it was, was complicated financial uh, work. And um, I handed it all over to them at the time, and they knew at the time that uh, there was a, a group of professionals and a group of individuals that were not interested in following the law, and that law was the Debt Act. Thank you, Senator Former. Do you have anything? Yes, just a couple questions. Um, since the, the Special Projects Fund is, the quote Special Project Fund is, is not part of the forensic audit, where do we go to get that information? I would be very happy to come back and uh, talk at a later point in time about the Special Project Fund. I think uh, I, more than anyone else, have really researched that issue and looked at the money that went in and out of the Special Projects Fund. Um, I did that on my time with the authority, and I made a lot of documents public. It's my contention you can't understand the swaps and how complicated and why they were done until you understand that fees from swaps were used to pay for artifact purchases. It's my contention you can't understand the, the, the real issue of, um, of the intermingling of the, of the school district, the parking authority, the Harrisburg authority, all under the leadership of one political individual until you see direct transfers being dictated from the parking authority to the Harrisburg authority. You don't understand why Barlow failed until you begin to see that money came out of the Resource Recovery Fund to pay for, for, for artifacts that could have been used to hire uh, a financial person to check Barlow's books or a project manager to be out, out there and make sure that we're good. We're talking about over $12 million over a 10-year period of questionable artifact purchasing, much of which was not related to a Wild West Museum, Egyptian mummies, Sumerian necklaces, questionable receipts, and tens of thousands of dollars that went to the mayor personally, personally as reimbursement for items that nobody saw other than the mayor and that were listed in the inventory as being unknown, whereabouts unknown, location unknown. And what are your recommendations to hold the uh, professionals accountable? Well, you can't have the professionals be the police, and maybe you do, and I, I'm sorry if, my comments came across personally. Again, I've never met Mrs. Berrettini, but maybe you do want some sort of rule in place that says folks can't move from DCAD as the regulators to the very firms that they were regulating, uh, you know, like that. Maybe there should be time and distance between that. I know it's a very small community, these municipal finance experts and bond lawyers, that they all know each other, but it's definitely part of the problem when there's this, this shifting between DCAD and the private uh, marketplace. I don't think you get that. That's one thing that you can, you can look to do. I think, however, our law enforcement arms are what let us down. I really don't believe you have a, a problem with the law. You have a problem with nobody being willing to enforce the law. I think the Attorney General could have enforced the law, still could. Maybe you should uh, contact the Auditor General. Certainly the U.S. Attorney could do something, but part of what you can do uh, through this hearings process is that you can bring people to the table who have not yet cooperated with the forensic audit and get them to go on the record. That's not prosecuting. That is establishing a series of facts, which then those who are in the law enforcement side of things can use to potentially make a case. We have not heard from James Ellison. He has not uh, spoken. I don't believe he co uh, cooperated with the uh, forensic audit. He was the mastermind of the 2007 borrowings along with the county. We haven't heard from Chuck Swally, we haven't heard from Jay Winger. These are the folks that have not cooperated with the forensic audit that knew what they were doing when they were doing it and ought to be brought before you to testify. And again, ironically, in Carol Kacharis and Eckerd Siemens, you're dealing with some of the largest law firms in the state. And part of what you should be concerned about is not only 
that uh, this happened in Harrisburg, but that the very folks that did this are still professionals in the state of Pennsylvania advising municipalities on how to file clean certificates. What does that say? That nobody has been held accountable from Eckerd Siemens or from Eddie Evans or from Rosen Sinan or from any of the other big firms that benefited professionally from these deals. And that's what's in the forensic audit too. You'll see it. The money wasn't going to fix the Harrisburg incinerator. It was going to pay the professionals. And why would the professionals stand up and stop the income coming in unless they had some sort of you know, um, strong moral sense of outrage, which I believe that they should have had, but they, they had every financial incentive to continue doing what they were doing. And if DCED is going to take the position that they are just bookkeepers who um, you know, are not going to be reflective of the public will or the legislature's will to effectively take a look at these, these documents that are being filed, which aren't just paperwork. These are statements of, of, uh, of what is believed to be true. These are, these, are, these are legal filings that are being made. If they're going to take that position, then uh, you're going to have to uh, beef up, or you're going to have to call for the other uh, uh, enforcement arms of, of, of sort of state government to, to step in. So I would beef up DCED. I would put laws in place to help regulate um, the professionals and their in and outs with governments and contributions. I was also very concerned at the time that professionals like Carol Kucheris, uh Bruce Barnes, who's the financial advisor, were giving money. This is not illegal, but we're giving money to the campaign committee for the mayor at the very time that they were being awarded these, uh, these contracts. We have a real problem with that pay to play in the state of Pennsylvania. And that's something that you could, you could look at and learn from as well. But the number one thing that you can do is bring people before you who haven't yet spoken to the public about what happened. And I would encourage you to do that and let the facts lead in the direction that the facts lead. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming today. We, we, we appreciate your help with this, uh, with this hearing.